sometimes there'll be like a story about like a murder and then the next story I have to be like, and there was a rubber ducky race today. And so I'm like, <clears throat> Ooh. and there was a rubber ducky race. It's just, it's just rough. It's rough. And then I'll go on and tell my producer, I'm like, why would you put those two stories next to each other? Welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators and a space where we share our stories on all things queer related. My name is Brie Walker, Brie Logan on all platforms. And if you're not listening to this on Apple Podcasts and you're not subscribed, what you doing, baby? Hit that subscribe button. If you're listening on Spotify, give us a follow. Guys, we have a fantastic guest on today. She's a news anchor for WLWT Channel 5 in Cincinnati, Nasty Natty. She's a TikTok creator and a speaker and advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. You can find her at Megan.Mitchell with four L's on TikTok. Uh, please welcome Megan Mitchell. Hey, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. This is like so fun. Also, the dog might, um, the, he has a squeaky toy, so we're just going to ignore that. Oh, that's okay. Unless it I'm becomes sure. a problem. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm this sure all the life. dog lovers don't care. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. Sorry. Good. <laughs> it was so funny. I didn't know that you were a news anchor until I got on TikTok and I saw one of your viral videos and I was like, holy shit. And you had only had maybe like 30K on it. And I was like, she's going to blow up. I can tell. And I literally watched you skyrocket. Like I watched your entire thing skyrocket. I watched you get verified on TikTok. I was like, she's had the most growth I've ever seen of anyone in such a short period of time. And I was like, I need to get her on the podcast. Three, this has been the craziest time. I don't, I don't even know how to like articulate what's happening because I have followed queer content, not just on TikTok, on YouTube, uh, for years, right? Like I was one of those people that was like, even the like years before I came out was like, Ellen and Portia, la la la, like you're such mm -hmm. a loser. So I was like always engaging with like queer content on these platforms. So the fact that like, I was like, you know what? I'll take a gander at it. <laughs> and it was like, bam, 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 bam. I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, so, so shook. So it's been fun. It's been fun. It's, you know, what? and I gotta say, especially TikTok, I mean, the community by lesbian, like the women loving women community on TikTok is like so supportive and nice. I, I really don't think I've gotten like one mean comment or anything. It's just like the best little community. Like everybody is hyping each other up. I'm like, what is this? This is like the opposite of what like we say, fem you know, like, oh, women against women. It's just like TikTok breaks yeah. those barriers. Love it. Exactly. I love that too. There's so much empowerment. I will say if you stay on gay TikTok, there's a lot of empowerment, but I have, I've had a, a like a lot of videos, not a lot. I'm not going to like shut myself up, but I've had videos go viral. And the ones that go on a straight TikTok is when I see the most negative comments and it's from straight white cis men. And right? that's, I have been getting like all of these comments on, on my most viewed video. Just one of the ones where you see me like wearing a suit in the studio. And at first I'm seeing this, like, like a bunch of flames and like gay flags. And I'm like, Oh wow. Like fire, you know, she's hot or whatever. Yeah. And then I realized that they're burning the gay flag in the comments on my TikTok. There's like hundreds of burned gay flags. And I'm like, Oh, oh my, gosh. my gosh, I'm not on lesbian TikTok anymore. No. no. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I mean, <laughs> I would love to stay on gay TikTok, but it is good to get on straight TikTok to assimilate for people to see that content. And so for I people totally to agree. challenging and doing that kind of shit, even though it's hate stuff, at least it's getting notoriety. People are commenting. So then more people are going to see it. So then more people yes. are to see queer culture and it'll, it, it's assimilated. Welcome. Yes. No, yeah. it, it is. And, and I, I do love TikTok as a whole for the most part. I'm like, come on over. I, and I don't even know if these comments are real, but like, I know you've seen these comments that are like, yeah. wait, I'm straight though, or something. And it's like, yeah, them question. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, are you, I'm, I, those comments confuse me so much. Cause I'm like, are you actually straight? Or are you just saying that as a funny, I don't, I still don't know to this day. I love when people comment and they're like, oh my God, I love this, but just want to let you know I'm straight. It's like, you can like it and still be straight. I, I don't, I didn't question your sexuality when you commented, but they like wanted to make sure you're like, well, I know you can't tell from me and like maybe my profile, but like, uh, I'm straight. Literally. I don't comment on straight people's things being like, this is amazing, but I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you two together, but I'm gay. So like, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. 
I did want to talk about, because you posted it, I actually, I followed your Twitter today, and I don't know if you posted on your Twitter or your Facebook. I did a, a hefty amount of stalking for this podcast episode, by the way, just to let you We know. love to see it. We <laughs> love to see it. You've got to be a good podcast host. you got to know your, you got to know your uh, guests. But uh, as a journalist, I totally understand. Research yeah. is key. Well, there you go. But I did see that you had posted about the TikTok ban and how that whole thing's going down, because this isn't the first time it's happened. This is the second time that it's happened since BLM, not going to say that it's because of BLM, but it might be, um, about the government uh, trying to intervene on this social media platform and how this TikTok ban news has been resurfacing. What is your take on it? It's been so crazy. And can I just say, like, the moments that it happens, I believe the first kind of crazy round happened, like, July 8th and July 9th. And that's mm-hmm. when there was – remember there was that glitch? Do you remember that glitch? Yes. And everyone Beautiful. was like, no, no, TikTok is banned. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Fortunately, that was just a glitch. And I remember, like, even, like, Charlie D'Amelio being like, no, don't worry. We talked to TikTok. And we're like, don't worry. Charlie's got us, you guys, you know. <laughs> she talked to TikTok. And then – you know, when this weekend happened, I mean, it was like a direct comment from the president, right? So mm-hmm. it, it was like, okay, I am going to shut TikTok down. So then Saturday happened. Of course, I am on air. So I anchor Saturdays yeah. and Sunday mornings. So I'm like, and TikTok. And of course, I, I'm i not like, you have to be unbiased when you're delivering a story. You know, it's untruthful, I think, for people to say, you know, like anchors can't have opinions or views. Like, of course, we have opinions or views. Mm-hmm. We're literally humans. Like, that's what happens. But you know, you just have to present it in a way that is informed and balanced. So I am sitting there at the anchor desk and I'm like, and TikTok is possibly going to get a ban today. And I had a tweet from someone, just one of the random viewers in Cincinnati that was like, Megan, I just want to give you kudos. I know how hard that was for you to get through that story. Aww. I'm like, thank you for acknowledging that. But yeah, it's been crazy. I feel like the last three days has been like a roller coaster up and down, a whirlwind. So the latest I've heard was Microsoft is going to buy TikTok. I don't know exactly what percentage of the company it's going to buy. Initially, we heard it was only going to be the data that is stored and used, you know, to to advertisers and to sell in in that respect to make money. And that was going to be, you know, sold to an American company, right? So like Microsoft would own it. So we didn't have to worry about possibly, you know, a foreign government getting our data. Now that Microsoft has bought or is going to buy TikTok, I mean, that doesn't equate into a reason why you could shut something down. So the argument can get really murky and it also could take much longer now that that is out of the equation. So, yeah. you know, obviously we'll see what the presidential election has in store, but it doesn't seem like it's something that could happen within the next four or five months, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, the first one, I didn't take too much stock in. I thought it was just buzz. And so I was right. like, oh, well, I'll just use this to create content to then cross promote to other platforms and just kind yeah. of ride the wave of uncertainty and which I'm still doing like for this one, I'm just promoting other platforms hardcore just in case because there's such a huge queer community here. I'm like, well, shit, if it actually happens, like there's this whole queer community and culture here on TikTok that's going to be lost in just this, this point in time in history during this pandemic. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to extend this? How am I going to make sure that this doesn't go away completely? Like, what do I need to do as an influencer on this platform to make sure that doesn't happen? So like, I've been creating content to make sure and making sure people know about this podcast. Cause like, I'm still going to interview people no matter what. I'm still going to interview mm-hmm. queer TikTokers and, you know, eventually other creators and influencers in the space and stuff like that. But yeah, it made me, I definitely switched my stuff to Canada this time, my phone to Canada. Not that I think it'll help because we'll need a VPN, but like, right. It it definitely had me a little, a little nervous. It's so true. And, and, specifically about the community that is on TikTok. We mentioned it earlier, but like the queer women community on TikTok is like no other. Like the abilities of the For You page to show you stuff that is pertinent to you is is unlike any other platform. I mean, you can't duplicate it on Instagram as much as they want to try. Even on yeah. YouTube. I mean, yeah. it's just a different way to engage an audience. And to me, it's a great way to engage in stuff that is so perfectly relevant to you mm-hmm. in such a quick way that it would be really, I think, uh, a disappointment if it, if it went away. People post things similarly to, I feel like with Snapchat stories, people wouldn't post the same things on their Instagram stories as they would their Snapchat stories as they would maybe mm-hmm. only fans, you know, where I'm getting at with TikTok, I feel like it has a vulnerable, there's a vulnerable space where people can be who they want to be regardless of what it is. And they can talk about their deepest insecurities, their fears, desires, those kind of things, anything that could be 
labeled as taboo, anything like that, which I absolutely love. And I hate the fact that if this goes down, I don't know where people would be able to express themselves in that way. Yeah, I, I feel the exact same way. How funny yeah. are all of the TikToks of people being like, Trump, like, yeah. when they're like trying to like, be like we love you. <laughs> they're twerking on them. They're like, or they're building yeah. the, building the bricks. Like, they're like, hey, yes. I'm going to walk too. Like, <laughs> so that's the TikTok community, man. It's so funny. It makes me laugh so hard. I saw one where this, where this girl was like, Trump, we love you. You're the best. Like your hair, everyone's making fun of it. I love it. I love everything about it. You know, if you want to keep TikTok, go for it. Like she's totally schmoozing it. It's like, the funniest thing I've ever seen. It's just oh like the perfect way of like political, like you're trying to like, you know, push a political agenda, essentially yes. a political agenda. Trump has made this political it's while funny. also doing it in a TikTok way, which is just with hilarity and with like a great sense of humor. So. Yeah. With comedy and a trending hashtag and a trending, uh, yes. trending topic and a trending <laughs> music. So yeah. Hashtag FYP. Yeah. <laughs> If it's on the for you, let's go. That is so funny. So what made you come on to TikTok initially? Was it professional? Was it personal? Or like, was it both? It was my brother. He's yeah. 18. He was just like, oh yeah, you want to be like in my TikToks? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he was kind of like, because so, I was home for a week, you know, it was the first time I like drove home ever because I'm from Connecticut. Okay. So drove home, obviously wasn't going to fly. And it was just like, I had nothing to do for a week. And so I was like dancing with him and learning all these dances. And I was like, and before that, for, for literal months, probably when the pandemic started, I had like been on TikTok, actively engaging in the content specifically with like queer women. Yeah. Why would I, yeah. Why would I go on straight TikTok? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was the first time that I actually put content up and I was like, oh, this will be fun. Like I know all the jokes, simping, you know, all, all of that stuff. So I'm like, this is like going to be fun. And then my brother said, he's like, you know, Megan, like, I, I don't think that there are many news anchors on there. Like, I don't know why, but like, if you did that, like, I think he's like, I think it could get like a following. And because I had already started posting, it wasn't, it didn't feel like a big YouTube because there's some, you know, news reporters, there's one in our area that, that has a YouTube channel. And it just didn't seem like something that ever really fit what I wanted to do. And so this was like the perfect way to be like, oh, these are like short, fun videos. I really like comedic videos. So like I can make some funny, I can make some informative. And that's kind of, I feel like what it's turned into a little bit. And also like dancing, it's just like super fun. Yeah. And then showing also like my style. So I was like, wow, this is like a really fun way to do all of that. Don't shut it down, Trump. <laughs> yeah, please. But no, I, that's funny. I didn't know because you had done stuff with like on set and things like that. So I was like, Ooh, I wonder, this is like my like business, like marketing brain. I'm like, Oh, I wonder if it's because if it's for professional reasons that she's trying to hit a younger Ooh. demographic or what I like, it literally took me forever to send that email to the talent agency that's in your bio. I was like, I need to be so professional with this. This is a rag, little ragtag podcast that I just put together like six weeks ago. I was like, she's verified. Like I have to, I spent an hour like fucking writing up this goddamn. You did not need to do that. Thing. He just, literally ah! my agent just forwards me things all the time. I'm like, okay, okay. No. Okay. No. Okay. I've and then never done like, it. because of TikTok, I'm a journalist. So like ethically, I am not allowed to take money from anyone. Right. Yeah. So yep. I, I just within the last few weeks, because I've gained this following have had to like turn down all these people. My agent was like, Megan, like you can't accept brand deals. And I'm like, I know that I've known that forever. A lot of people have gotten in trouble in my industry for accepting, you know, you'll get 20% off if you shop this, blah, blah, blah. So I had to like put a little asterisk. I'm like, yeah. no brand deals, no sponsorships, but like, this is a perfect yeah. opportunity. Yep. You know what I mean? So. Yep. 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 Yeah. It took me forever. I had my mom look at it too. And I was like, mom, oh my does God. This professional. You're I was like, mom, <laughs> <laughs> well, usually I just DM people. Like I DM people and I have a I little script that. that I do. It's nice. But I was like, oh, she, she might get a lot of DMs and might not look at them. So I will go through the professional route. <laughs> Love it. it was perfect. Here but. we are. <laughs> uh -huh. So like being gay in the broadcast media journalism arena, like what has that journey been like for you? It's been weird because I, my first job was in North Dakota. Wow. Bismarck, North Dakota. I mean, there's 50,000 people that live in that city and it's the second biggest city in the state. There's like four hours of like nothing around it, except very small North Dakota towns, which I should say are adorable. It was a really tough time for me there. I think 
every time someone leaves college, there's like a moment where you're like, what is happening with my life? Yeah, completely. And so that was like going on. And I was in a place where it was like not okay to be gay. Um, yeah. Definitely had some stuff said to me with my ex at bars there that is just like not okay. Uh, or said to another one of my coworkers who's also gay. It was a really tough time, quite honestly. There were not many women there. I mean, I remember Tinder had just started at that point. Mm -hmm. which is great. Or maybe it was like gone. It was like, had been going for a year and I signed into it right when I got there. It was like, there were 10 people in my 50 mile radius. And I was like, whoa, wow. And so that was like a total shock to my system because I came out when I was in college in Boston and then was living the summers in New York city. So it was like, woo, you know, I was like loving my life, but it was definitely really tough. And at that point, like my parents were still working through it. I had been out for like a few years, came out my sophomore year of college. So like my parents weren't really the best support system at that time. They're amazing now. Hashtag it gets better. But like, it was, it was really tough, you know, quite honestly. And then I finally kind of came out to the viewers there and I did it in a social media post. And, and I, I mean, if you knew, you knew, like I was posting gay stuff all the time. Like I feel like yeah. there was like, so, you know, got my undercut, got things that are like indicators, but like exactly. finally it was after the Pulse nightclub shooting that I was like, I am gay. You guys know me. We all know me. I wake you up every morning. I'm gay. Let's not be crazy to each other. Then I moved to Cincinnati. And like, even though Cincinnati is a generally conservative city comparatively to other metropolitan areas in the country, it's been great. Like, I don't know if you can attest to, but like, there's a great little community here of queer people. Um, And I was able to like dive right in head first. And so that has been really nice. Right when I had my interview here in Cincinnati, the general manager of my station, Richard Dyer, he's an incredible guy. Uh, One of the questions he asked me when I was up in his presidential office is he was like, you know, what's the hardest thing you've been through? And I was like, professionally or personally? And he was like, either one. I'm like, well, it was one of those job interview things where you turn the bad into a positive. But I I think it applies. It was, I was like, you know, I, I had a really tough time coming out. My parents didn't accept me at first and it has gained so much empathy within myself towards communities of color, towards the LGBTQ community, obviously, um, towards just minorities in general, because now I understand what it feels like to be oppressed and understand like that those communities have their own cultures and subcultures that are super valid to them. And like reporting on them, just like they're, you know, any other population would do them injustice. So I feel like it was almost like a good thing that I was able to like see the, see the positives in having a queer experience. You know what I mean? It's something that other people can't relate to, but I think it's gained so much empathy for me in my life. Being in North Dakota, you were able to see what middle America really is. And I feel like it it can be hard if you are from an area or had those experiences where you were accepted. And like you said, you, you know, were spending summers in New York, which is obviously very, you know, progressive and, and pro LGBTQ people. So like, it's sometimes it's hard to be like, is it really that bad? Like, is it really that bad out there? Is it, is our conversion, you know, therapy still going on? Like all of these like horrible things that like, sometimes like I will say because of privilege and, you know, don't have to deal with. And so I feel like you having those experiences being an authority in this space and being, you know, someone to look up to, specifically in Cincinnati, but just anywhere that you are waking people up in the morning and with being a news anchor, it really keeps it in the forefront of your brain so that you can be that advocate. Yeah. And I would hope so. Because when I was in North Dakota, there was um, just like different stories that were going on within the reservation. So there's like four different Native American reservations in North Dakota. And, you know, for years, there had never been a Native American reporter, but I had created some great connections within the community there and ended up doing an entire documentary on Two-Spirit Native Americans, which is LGBTQ people who are Native American. And I mean, to be able to make that documentary and share it with the population of North Dakota was, I think, you know, a win for the LGBTQ community because, I mean, these people had been accepted for millennia. I mean, it was revered to be LGBTQ, to be essentially two spirits. So you have the spirit of a woman and a man is what that means. Okay. And so, you know, the women would go out and and fight in, in the battles and the men would be sewers or even uh, you know, they would be medicine men. And so until Europeans came and Christianity came and was imposed on them by colonizers, 
they were really accepted. And so then when marriage equality passed in 2015, when I was in North Dakota, these reservations have their own sovereignty. They have their own power, their own governments. They still didn't have marriage equality, even though they had been accepting LGBTQ people for thousands of years before. So I was like, this is, this is a crazy injustice. And I just felt like it needed to be shared. And so like to be able to have the empathy that like, Hey, I already have this in, in the LGBTQ community and I can share something about native Americans that people don't know. I mean, like that was like a win-win. I definitely got a lot of pushback from my bosses at the time as to whether or not they wanted to air that documentary. Even after I finished it, they refused to air it, but they finally did. And it was like, I got them to do it on a Saturday night. <laughs> they were like, we're going to do it at wow. 3 a.m. on a Sunday. I'm like, no, you're not. And it ended up getting like uh, the National Association of LGBTQ Journalists, like local broadcasting award out of like New York, L- LA, like Chicago, all of these places, because I think it was just something that like people didn't understand was happening, you know? Yeah. Not today, Brad. We're not putting it on at 3 a.m. We're fucking putting it on a primetime spot on Saturday. Primetime, baby. <laughs> I call all the cis men Brad. If I'm making fun of cis men, I call them Brad, cis white men. Noted. But, uh, Noted. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Um, you, you, you're using your privilege with, because everyone has different levels of privilege and you were using it for the best and possibly, you know, risking your career in the process. So that's super brave. I admire the shit out of you for doing that. Like not a lot of people would be able to do that. So Thank that's you. awesome. That's very sweet of you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And if anybody wants to see that, that is on my YouTube page. So I'm going to link that later. Send it's me on my the YouTube link. Channel. I can put it in I the will. episode notes. It is funny. I saw, like, there is gay indigenous uh, TikTok, and I definitely got on it. At some point, I hit it. And so I was seeing... I I, need to get in there. There's a specific creator. I forget his name, but he is posting some of the historical things, some of the stuff that you touched on in, you know, his TikToks in a funny, relatable way. And it was something that I didn't know. And I have... Native American heritage, not enough to, to claim Native For American, sure. you know, or do anything like that, but enough to where like For I sure. have people who are, who are in it and stuff like that. So I had no idea. Absolutely. That, that, that stuff exists. The history behind it, right? Yes. Absolutely crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not crazy. It, it makes sense. I don't know why I said crazy. It makes total no, sense. No, but it's crazy that people don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. The level of things that aren't being taught in American school systems is absurd and many other words that I won't uh, put in here, but. (laughs) No, I I agree. I totally agree. Um, I'm trying to figure out a segue. Sometimes segues are super easy to segue into things and then sometimes we get off topic. As an anchor, I understand completely. Sometimes there'll be like a story about like a murder and then the next story I have to be like, and there was a rubber ducky raised today. And so I'm like, <clears throat> and there was a rubber ducky race. It's just, it's just rough. It's rough. And then I'll go on and tell my producer, I'm like, why would you put those two stories next to each other? She doesn't do it often. It's very rare. She's amazing. But yeah, I, I do like the queer culture in Cincinnati. I grew up about an hour outside of the city. So I grew up Where? in like a country town. I grew up in Mainville in Little Miami. I know, I know Mainville for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Love that's it. Up. So it was nice. You know, it's a small little town. I liked the school. There just isn't a lot of diversity. I mean, there's socioeconomic diversity, which is great to learn about that. But there is absolutely no racial diversity. I mean, I, I can name the, the kids that were not white in my class. I feel that. I only, I feel that. I only graduated with like maybe 250 kids. Mm-hmm. And I knew wow. that since I was in kindergarten because I grew up and yeah. I was my whole time was at that school. Definitely didn't see a lot of queer representation growing up and stuff like that. But moving to the city, I've been living downtown for two years and okay. I worked downtown. And the queer culture is definitely a lot better. I mean, we have gay bars, which is not something that yeah. I realized when I came out a few years ago. And we have just ally bars like bars that are very queer friendly that aren't like specifically totally. queer, you know i Any love favorites qcr qcr is one of my favorites that's uh i mean yeah. the, it's not like go to the queer you know like that's the thing i go to the bar and i'm like hey girl we know we wait it's like are you are you yes bitch I'm yes yeah <laughs> That's how I feel about many of the bartenders at specifically QCR, so. Oh, yeah. I know one of the bartenders has dreads. I've clocked her. She's a 100-footer. And there's another one. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> I, ma- I actually matched with her. <laughs> if she's listening to this, I matched with you on Hinge. So. Hey. Ayo. Funny stuff. 
I think I, I said know, I liked her dress. I don't remember. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm not feminine enough for her, but <laughs> anyways. And then there was this one girl. I think I got, I hit on her. I got drunk and it was a, uh, it was, it's funny because it was a work event. I like how you just said, I think I hit on her, which yeah, is just a I hilarious did. statement. I think I did. <laughs> she had rainbow I think that socks. that might have accidentally happened. And she it's had amazing. a Zodiac tattoo. I don't remember what it was, but I'm like, that's two for two. <laughs> like, and she's dating. Okay. Somebody. She didn't, she didn't uh, say who she was dating though. She made the pronoun. She had vague pronouns. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, at least I was rough. Yeah. We love QCR. I love QCR and birdcage obviously. And below bird zero. Cage. I love and below a birdcage is like, my, I feel like, like birdcage is like my home. It's like where like I've created like my, my people, my bartenders are there. I really love the owner and the manager. And so like, I feel like at home at, at Birdcage. So yeah. they used to have these women nights every other Sunday um, last really? year. So the beginning of 2019. Yeah. I was just at Birdcage and now they switched their times. They're not even going to be open because they're like, it's pointless to be open um, if we can't do yeah. anything after 10 p.m. I was literally, literally just there like last Thursday or something like that. Yeah. And it was popping, like popping late at night. Yeah. And then they said it we're closing indefinitely because they can't just be open from like four to 10. Yeah. So oh, I get that. Below Zero is still open though because I get their note. I follow not- them on Instagram, but they are still open, Amazing. which is nice. But yeah, I do. I like the queer culture down here. It is a kind of a closer knit community. I'm not in it too. I'm not like deep, deep in it, but I'm sure I will be in about five years. <laughs> Honestly, so. it's like you meet one person and then I just was like just introduced to literally like everyone. And so now I'm like, I'm swimming in the deep end, baby. I'm like there. <laughs> I'm here. I'm queer. I'm like, yeah, every time I go to any place, I'm like, hey, Sally. Hey, Bob. That's absolutely amazing. I feel like I want to yeah. get to that point. I definitely found more queer friends through TikTok, which is interesting. Like totally uh, there's a that. few creators in Cincinnati and then there's some really? in Columbus and there's some in Cleveland. So we all hang out. I so love that. yeah, obviously you're welcome to whenever we have stuff. Um, if you need more Guys, queer friends, but I would we love. do. We've I been mean, I can never get enough queer friends. So let's do it. Me too. Yeah. And we, uh, we meet up like every once in a while and we collaborate and we'll like make stupid videos. Honestly, the videos that we make are like cringy as fuck when we get together, but it's fun. It's super fun. It's mm-hmm. like, it's a good old lesbian time. So I know that you had, you know, talked about living in Connecticut and then moving to um, North Dakota and then actually, you know, being in Cincinnati where you're at now. How has been, you know, moving to a city by yourself? Um, how were you able to kind of get into finding other LGBTQ plus people and like navigating that since, you know, you were doing stuff on your own. It's such a great point. So I feel like I did it wrong in North Dakota so I can have people learn from that, but I did it right in Cincinnati. So like in North Dakota didn't go out, even like the people that I I went on like one date and we became friends, but like wasn't connected to queer people, ended up moving to DC. So I did not really try essentially like I I went to pride in North Dakota was 50 people on a riverboat down the river that was pride oh wow it was so cute um but I I made some connections there nothing that really stuck um just even friend wise and so when I got to Cincinnati I was like we're gonna check everything off the list because I really wanted to engage myself in the queer community so initially I don't know if you ever heard of auto straddle writes a lot of queer, yes. like, yes, women articles. And so I know that there was this article that said queer spots in Cincinnati for queer women, right? Went to that article, saw the author of that article, found her on Facebook, because I'm a crazy person, and just reached out. And this person, they use they, them pronouns. They were like, hey, you know, I actually run an entire group for queer women in Cincinnati called Cincy Stradlers. And so on Facebook, I just went into this group and there's hundreds of queer women. Introduced myself, was able to connect with a few, hung out with them, went to like Halloween with them. Um, And to this day, I still hang out with quite a few of them. But even more so than that, there are other specifically gay men in news. There's, I don't think there's any other, I think I'm the only queer woman on air in Cincinnati. But I then started going with them to Below Zero, to these bars in Cincinnati. And then we started kind of saying, Hey, to the bartender and then talking with the bartender and then like meeting different groups of people. And through that, I was able to really get connected with the HRC. I posted a few events for them 
uh, like their fashion show every year and some smaller events about LGBTQ realtors and all of these random groups because I just kept getting introduced to people because once you get introduced to one person, like mm-hmm. I feel like subcultures, you know, these mini groups of like the LGBTQ community, specifically women in the LGBTQ, you're so willing to, to connect with them because we all share somewhat uh, of the same experience. We don't share a singular experience, but we all understand the trials and tribulations of, of your identity, of questioning your identity and what that looks like and what can come from that. So I feel like having that connection already as an LGBTQ person can set you up perfectly for meeting people in a new city because you already have that layer of understanding, you know? Um, yeah. So I would say just reach out to everyone, go to those bars. Ladies, we don't need to be home all day. I know you want to be, but you can't if you want to meet people. Lesbians, don't do it. <laughs> gotta listen to Megan, guys. You gotta, gotta put yeah. yourself out there. It is hard. It's a pandemic. There's restrictions. Yes. We got a lot going on. Oh, yes. On. Not now. Don't do it now. True. <laughs> pandemic. No. But after, let's get a vaccine. Let's go. There get that go. bread. Mm-mm-mm. Then leave. You know? <laughs> I love how you bleeped it. I love how you bleeped it. I just, I have to. I need a bad bleep. Uh, Addison Ray, anyone? Ooh, yeah. Oh, anyway, yeah. I'm bleeping myself like Addison Ray. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. It's something that I get a lot in my DMs and in my questions. And it's, um, I feel like I answered a question about people like, how do I find queer women and things like that? I did it on, well, the podcast I just released today. Um, it's one of the most like asked questions I get is like, I'm gay. I don't know how to connect with other people. The whole, the whole key is like connecting and finding community. That's yeah. like the, the ticket. And then, you know, once they have that, then it's just getting the courage to go out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. And then even like you were suggesting before, it's a little bit harder because obviously TikTok is a worldwide platform, but the way that I got into specifically lesbian TikTok was I just found a bunch of creators I liked really quickly on the platform and just started following them. I Mm -hmm. went to like different queer people that I know, looked at who they followed and just pressed like, you know, follow, follow, follow. Then you can kind of tailor it from there, you know? Oh, I like this person that's coming from my For You page. And then you can start to see, are these people in my area? So if you move to a new city, then you could say, hey, you know, I also live in that area. If you want to do a collab, like, let's meet up. You know what I mean? So like, exactly. that, that sounds like a, a great way to, to meet people as well. I mean, do it safely. Um, if, don't yes. do it if they seem sketchy, but, uh, yes. but you can gauge that, you know, I think that's something that you can, you can definitely tell. Yeah. We have Facebook groups. There's meetup.com. That's an app. And like, I actually yes. went on that and there's groups there. If you're in, yeah. I know with the pandemic, but this is, this is a, this is a little sweet spot. If you are in college and you want to find queer women, take a gender studies class, take a women history class. The gays are all there. It changed my life. It changed (laughs) my life. Like seriously, I yell about this all the time. My feminist cultural theory, queer dreams class, like there's two of them, that they were life-changing in so many ways, met everyone that I'm friends with in college. And it was like mind blowing. Do it people. I'm a women and gender studies major or minor, so. Hey, I did not know that. That's awesome. Love it. That's super cool. Another thing, TikTok. If you make, TikTok is geolocated. So if you make a TikTok, it's going to go to the people that are surrounding you first and then it's going to go out as it, you know, gains views and things like that. I so if you no use, idea. yes, it is very geolocated. So it's great for small businesses and creators are looking for people in a geolocated area, fun fact. But yeah, if, and you can so also fun. use hashtags. So like I just did a post about being a Midwest lesbian and I get all the Midwest lesbians because they see, oh, I'm a Midwest lesbian. And then I put, you know, Midwest lesbian. And then I put Ohio check. And then I, you know, and then you get the comments, like all the comments, because everyone is like, oh my God, she lives in the Midwest or oh, she lives in mm-hmm. Ohio. So like, if you make one of those, there's a sound that when you just say hi, it's like the one that's like, don't mess it up, don't mess it up high or something like that. I did that. Yeah. And like, I, I met people just in the comments because everyone wants to say where they're from, like, and relate to, you know, that. So like, if you want to make a video on that, not make it be a TikTok or make videos, but like, if you do want to meet people, that's a good way to do it too. Absolutely. I love it. If you guys didn't hear Sam and Madeline's episode, we do an in-depth discussion about um, finding queer people, but that was just a little, a little special treat for you guys. You addressed on your video about developing an eating disorder related to 
um, just seeing some toxic masculinity that was present in gay culture. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. You know, I think it's, I think it's tough because specifically body positivity, which is one of my favorite things on the internet, a lot of it is geared towards heterosexual people, straight people, right? Mm -hmm. Women who are attracting the desire of men. So in that thought process, you are, you know, trying to, to get them to say, hey, you don't need to look like what men want you to look. I mean, that's kind of the goal behind that. You know, you don't need to be the desire of a man's life, his male gaze, you know? So it's like, in that narrative, like I just didn't see anything and I, I, tr I don't see anything really. Um, there's a few amazing creators who I, I, I followed throughout the years who like will touch on it and stuff. But like as a queer woman, like I would see these like <laughs> Florida lesbians who have six packs and they're so tan and they like showing it off at every chance that they can get, which is their right. And that's why I said in that thing, it's not, it's not the creator's fault. Like you do you, but when us as the viewer, when we are viewing these pictures, thirst traps, whatever, videos, just recognize that that is not something that you have to obtain to, you know, in the comments, you see, oh my God, oh my God, hot, 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 whatever, whatever, just any comment that's like that. You don't need to look like that to like actually get attention. So like last year, I was getting so frustrated because I started working out like crazy a few years ago. And I just wasn't seeing the results because I would eat the amount that I would like work out that day. And so I was like, dang it, like, I'm so mad. I still like I have like a six pack underneath my flab, but like the flap was there, you know, and so yeah. I was like, I'm gonna restrict myself like and I'm gonna this is just like a trigger warning for anybody who has had an eating disorder at this point. I would restrict myself to like 1200 calories a day then it just started getting bad because if I didn't stick to that 1200 calories a day on like a Sunday when I wanted to eat a bunch, then it was like, okay, I'd been restricting so much. I started binging and then I started purging. And so that's when like, after about a month, I told my therapist that I was doing it. And like, fortunately, like we were able to nip it in the bud rather quickly because I was just like very open and honest about that experience. But like, it's just really tough. And I just have not seen it like geared towards queer women. And like, mm -hmm. the other thing is I think, you know, there's this notion that like, for me, I don't want to look like Kim Kardashian. I mentioned that in that video. Like, yeah, I don't want to have the body fat that I have because to me in my brain, body fat equals femininity. You know what I mean? So like yeah. wider hips, like wider thighs, like that is like feminine features that I didn't want. Right. And so like the way I wanted to be perceived that I was like, you know, I'd buy clothes from the boys section and they didn't look right on me because I have like an hourglass figure, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm very petite, but like somewhat of an hourglass figure. And so it was just like really tough for a long time to like look the way I wanted to look, not even on the beach, but like then in this masculine clothing, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to appear kind of having this like tomboy vibe, you know, and I, I just felt like my body fat equal femininity, which equaled like me not getting the look that I really wanted. And so I just, I feel like we just need to tell people like, you don't need to look like the people that are on Instagram. You don't need to look like the people who are in those queer yep. clothing websites or magazines to be able to be masculine. Mm -hmm. Your body fat does not equal femininity. You know yes. what I mean? So I feel like that's what I wanted to like get with that. I love that. And I think that video help is helping so many people. And it's interesting because I always thought, and this is something that I realized pretty quickly into like my first relationship with a woman was I thought that the um, body image issues stemmed from heteronormative culture because it stemmed from men and the patriarchy and putting those pressures on women. And obviously consumerism and ads saying that you're not enough and you need this and that exactly. and this and that. And to I be, thought, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, oh, great. In the queer community, like women are free from that. They're free from the, those type of cultural standards. They're not going to have those issues because women aren't perpetuating that, especially in the queer community, aren't really perpetuating it as much. What I found out is that's not the case. Like it has no. seeped, it has seeped into it and it doesn't matter if you are gay or if you're a straight, like there's still so many women who have body image issues regardless of that. And I was perplexed, like absolutely perplexed. Like I thought, because for me, it was super freeing. And I was like, oh, like I just assumed that everyone was like female empowerment, all of this shit, like yada, yada, yes. yada. And some of them are not. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I realized that. And so when I saw that video, I really connected to it because it, it really isn't the case. And it's not just, it's not like men saying that to, to women and it's not just the patriarchy and there's just, it's such a complex issue. And yeah, it, I think it's yeah. so important to mention that toxic masculinity is not a male trait. It can be yeah. a female trait. And mm-hmm. some people on TikTok, on Instagram do perpetuate that, that are women. Yeah. And what sucks is a lot of those influencers are young. They're young, they're impressionable themselves, and they're the ones that are at the top of the food chain that by all intents and purposes, they're ignorant. They've been living the same place. They haven't had a lot of worldly or cultural experience, and they're doing those kinds of things. And then there are some other people that are just ignorant in general, (laughs) you know what I mean? And just have a lot of clout and things like that. So it is really, really hard. Yup. Where you have young impressionable people who are looking up to young impressionable people who haven't had the requisite experiences and to have an authority and speak on the matter. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And like the fact that I gained that following that I did in such a quick amount of time, I was like, I obviously want to do all the trends of TikTok, but I also like want to tell some of these people like, hey, you don't need to do that to like engage with it, love it, whatever. But like, don't think that that needs to be you to like be able to get there. Like Mm -hmm. my stomach is flabby as fuck. You know what I mean? Like, but I just, you find a way to dress yourself. That's where you feel comfortable. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's really funny because like when I saw that, it was a couple weeks before I saw your video and I'm, I've never really, that's something that I'm, I, I'm super grateful for. I've never really had any of those body image stuff to, to a certain degree. And I started getting, feeling really weird because I'm in like, I am like a tomboy and I present like that, you know, in, in that kind yes. of space. Like I'm not like super masculine, but I'm not like super girly feminine, like I'm yes. in the middle, like I'm really small and petite, you know, mm-hmm. and normally I am, you know, in at least in the past have dated like feminine women and things mm-hmm. like that. Like, it kind of touched and uh, hit a nerve with me because I had kind of thought like, oh, like I have such uh, a petite, you know, everything about me is like petite, but like yeah. I have a lot of, you know, masculine traits and like I, I dress kind of in between um and i'm not really like a stem i'm just kind of like most of the time i dress like a 12 year old boy you know what i mean and sometimes i felt like i wouldn't be taken seriously by the women that i wanted to attract because i'm like really cute and like really adorable and like yeah it's so tiny you know and like i couldn't handle them you know something like all of these weird things that were running in my brain and it's not like any of these like like the women that i did like nobody perpetuated this like this was no something, it's just I, it's like came out of nowhere and I was like why do I have these insecurities about not being able to do what I think I need to do you know absolutely I think it's it's just the <clears throat> culture that like you see things and you recognize yourself either in them or not in them and so yeah. when you start to see that over and over and over you you think oh god like maybe I'm not this enough maybe I'm not that enough so like yeah. hopefully that swipe would make people be like you are enough as corny as that sounds. (laughs) (laughs) It it really took me off guard just because I was like, where did this come from? And I don't know if it's just because I've been on TikTok so much and like seeing those, cause I'm just not thirst trap lesbian. Like I just don't, like I I tried it. It's just not, it's not my brand. I'd rather be funny and goofy and and, and that kind of thing. And so I was like, but like, sometimes I want to be serious. Sometimes I want to project that, but it's just, yeah, it, it was definitely some, an insecurity of mine. So when I saw your video, I was like, oh, that like touched on it perfectly. Like that it really triggered me in the best way. Amazing. That's what I love but, to hear. I love to hear. Maybe I'll talk more <laughs> about it too. I get a lot of questions about people like asking how to present and how to label themselves and like definitely having those insecurities about like mm. having to have a label or not having a label or like thinking yeah. people won't date them because they don't have a label and people don't take them seriously and stuff like that. Uh-huh. I've definitely had a lot of those questions. Labels are crazy. I even made like a little video and I won't go too far into it that it was just like, so I like, no, I don't like men, but I'm like, am I a lesbian? Because sometimes I'm like, but what if I ever change my mind? It's just like yeah. labeling yeah. can feel really secure sometimes in the community that you're in, but can also feel really scary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because what if it changes? But like also who gives a shit? It can be really comfortable to identify with a certain label, but then if you start to kind of have feelings that maybe you're not that, then it like causes you're some like, disconnect because you're holding on to this past person that had identified with it. And then you're like, well, now if I change my mind, will it look like that I 
am unreliable, uncredible. People won't believe me if I switch. Ding, 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 ding. I didn't even come out as a lesbian. I came out as queer and I didn't really have, I was like, ah, like I'm just like, I'm a fluid sexuality. Like I like, yes, was very, very open about it. And it wasn't until TikTok that I decided I was like, yeah, I'm obviously a lesbian. I don't know why I didn't. I actually do know why I didn't. I had all of these negative connotations around comp head. So yeah. Yep. Love that. Love comp head. All right, guys, we're at the questions with the queer segment, part of the podcast where we try to answer your questions on life, love, happiness, et cetera, that we probably have no business trying to answer, but we're going to do it anyways. If you'd like to submit a question that could be chosen for this podcast, please send them to questions at queertalkpodcast.com for a chance to be featured. Email is also in the description below. You can put your name, age, wherever you're at in the world. Um, But if you also want to stay anonymous, you can do that as well. We can keep your identity private. This episode question comes from Taryn. She's 23. She's from Iowa. And she asks, Hey guys, love the podcast. I have been talking to this girl for about a month now. She's still in the closet and I've been out for two years. I'm a little concerned because it took a lot for me to come out and I'm not sure if I can go back in the closet. Any advice? Okay, so I I think it's like one of those, you know, old time phrases, but like communication is key. It sounds crazy, but like you have to communicate like everything, especially in regards to coming out. So like if I were her, I would say something along the lines of like, I've been out for two years and I am scared to go back in the closet. That's how I feel. How do you feel about that? Would you be willing, you know, to like continue dating me if that be the case? You know, obviously they have to have their own coming out story and process. But like, I think that's just something that like, you both have to realize your own boundaries because like both of them are valid in a relationship. And if that person is saying, Hey, you know, I am willing to come out and at least take those steps. Like, and if you're willing to support me in that, like then you found a match. If not, I think then it's, it's a great way to be like, okay, like not a bad thing, but then you can like move on a little bit more and and heal because you recognize that there's just something that you wouldn't be able to come to a, 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 conclusion that would have benefited both of your lives for because like if someone wants to wait to come out you do you my love like that's that's Mm -hmm. absolutely your call but both people have to be okay with what's going on because going back into the closet is not fun it's not fun it can cause just like not dysphoria but it can cause anxiety and so I think it just has to make be something that like both of you communicate about because like communication can make you even understand things about yourself that you didn't know so like go back and forth, have that conversation. Why are you feeling scared to go back in the closet? Maybe you can learn that, you know, through communicating. Brie? Yes. Your take. Take it away. (laughs) I'm coming in with the afternoon news after Megan Mitchell. I'm going to answer this question for you. We're going to go to a short-term break. (laughs) It's a really bad habit that I'm always like, and now, Brie? Back to you, Brie. Thank you so much, Megan. Okay. You're, you're um, so welcome. <laughs> do I have an anchor ready voice? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good morning. She's a news <laughs> anchor already. <laughs> yeah, let me see here. I agree with everything that you said. Communication is key. I think it's something, and it's hard when I don't know if this, she said it was her first relationship. I don't know if this is your first relationship, but setting boundaries is really, really big. And knowing your deal breakers is also really big. I know that it's super new in this relationship, but I would challenge you and anyone listening to really think like, is this something that I want to pursue long term in terms of like, got to figure out your deal breakers, right? Is this going to go very, you know, is this going to go very far, that kind of thing. So like, if dating someone that's in the closet or going back in the closet is a deal breaker for you, then it's a deal breaker. And you have to address that as much as you like that person, it might not fit with your life at this point. Or it's something that you want to pursue because you think that this person is the one or you still want to be with this person and you're willing to sacrifice those parts of yourself for that person. And that's a choice that you have to make. It's definitely different. I, I can speak to when I was a little gaby and I didn't respect my boundaries and because I, I didn't have them. I didn't have them to respect them. I didn't have those kind of things. And so that's kind of the main thing that I would say. 
is, is to have those boundaries and, and really make sure that you're not selling yourself short to where if this ends, you're like, wow, I can't believe I put up with this, this, and this, or it, it went, it didn't align with you. And I'm not saying that this, this um, woman that you're with isn't uh, great and amazing and all of that. Um, but it is hard for someone who hasn't come out to deal with a lot of those emotions, uh, even if they're partially out, which is something that I experienced. There's a lot of emotions that go into that. And if it's a first girlfriend situation, then that's a whole different thing too. I don't want to say that there's a reason that a lot of people who aren't out typically don't date people who aren't out, but there is a huge shift when you're out and you get after, you're after that first relationship, I think personally. I don't know if you can attest to that, Megan, but I would be honest with yourself and see if that's a deal breaker or not, and then have that hard conversation if it is, and if not, you know, you don't obviously want to affect that person and they're coming out, it's their journey. So I, I would never say to pressure or do anything like that. That's their own journey. But you got to figure out if you want to be on that journey. I totally agree. Hopefully this helps. Don't yell at us if it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, we're unqualified. We're not licensed therapists. She's an anchor and I'm in sales. So <laughs> take it or leave it, you know? Hey, Megan, do you want to answer some questions really fast? I need to answer these questions to survive. So great. That's what I've decided. <laughs> if you don't, death. Climb a mountain or jump from a plane? Climb a mountain, for sure. Sourdough bread or wheat bread? Sourdough. I'm a lesbian. <laughs> Ariel or Jasmine? Jasmine. Big spoon or little spoon? Mm, little spoon. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? Yes. Perfect lesbian fashion. There we go. Favorite queer movie? Favorite queer movie is Portrait of a Lady on Fire by far. Me too! I, wait, 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 can I just say, I am literally about to go paint portraits of that, like, um, ocean and the rock formation in, the, in an hour. Oh my God, like, are you paint serious? them. Yeah, they're not going to be good. I've never painted one thing in my life, but that is what I intend to go doing. I went to Michael's today and bought the paint for it because oh, I love that movie. Holy shit. I love that movie too. And I think it's funny because I have a friend who's French and she's gay and she thinks it's boring. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? It's everything and nothing. It's everything. It's the looks. It's the gazes. It's the, it's the power dynamic, which is back and forth. It's just amazing. It's so. the building of, it's the tender building of tension and it's not what they say. It's what they don't say. You get it. I'm out. That's all I got to say. We're done. The podcast is yes. over. <laughs> no, yeah. It's my favorite. It's at my absolute favorite. I, I cried. I watched it three times in a row. Like for three nights, mm -hmm. I watched it. And it's a two-hour oh. movie. And it's long. I, yes. Oh, I, and it's I in am, French. I <laughs> and I, yep. I, I mean, I bawled like a baby. Oh. I have similar issues to every one of the ones you just mentioned, so. Yes. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, Vans or Doc Martens? Doc Martens. Last song you listened to on repeat? Last song I listened to on repeat would probably be a Hamilton song just because of the resurgence recently. So like I satisfied. Is that, am oh. I going to get crucified for not seeing it? Mm, no, but like, you know, you can go take a hike. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, can, you can go jump in the pond if you're going to be a silly goose. You should watch it though. Disney Plus. Okay. Okay. Giving presents or getting presents? Um, giving. I love being like, do you love it? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, but come on. You're like in their face. You're like, but do you like it? That's me. I get presents and I don't like, like I throw away like everything. I don't like clutter. I'm not even like one of those like minimalist people. I just like am such an unorganized person that I'm just like, get it now. Yeah. <laughs> Last one. Do you believe in love at first sight? I believe in interest at first sight. Like you're like, why am I so intrigued by this person? Mm -hmm. Like, why am I so interested in them? Sometimes that has fallen flat for me, but sometimes like the, my first love, I remember being like interested in her like two years before we actually dated. Like I was like yeah. a freshman in college, dated a few people before her, like a few women. But then finally when that happened, I was like, oh, I've been obsessed with you for two years. Cool. So I feel like <laughs> obsessiveness at first sight. But like, I yes. wasn't like, I'm in love with her. Yeah. It did come out like two weeks after I recognized it though. Yeah. I feel like love is more of an enduring thing that takes time, but lust yes. is yes, immediate. Chemistry can be immediate. Lust can be immediate. The intrigue, you know. This, this is it. Yeah. You just wanted to be so around better someone. than I did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
that's it guys. Thank you so much for being on this podcast, Megan. If you want to check out more about Megan, you can find her at Megan.Mitchell with four L's on TikTok. As always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. If you enjoyed this episode, please drop us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Helps us get it discovered by more queer people just like you. That's it for this episode, my queers. Thank you for listening and subscribing. If you're not subscribed on Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button. Give us a follow on do it. Spotify. Megan says do it. Be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.